Banks tell FICO how to score credit reports. They advise them on what the FICO system should spit out. Oh, so, okay. So these scoring models and these credit bureaus do not exist for consumers or people like me and you. They, have, they exist for the big banks so that they could assess risk. Welcome to the Selling Sandoval podcast, where we dive deep into the world of real estate in sunny California. I'm your host, Victoria Sandoval, and I'm thrilled to have you join me as I sit down with top-notch professionals, market analysts, and influential leaders who have mastered the art of closing deals. Together, we'll explore the ever-evolving market trends, debunk myths, and empower you with the tools to negotiate like a pro. So whether you're a buyer, seller, or agent seeking inspiration, this podcast is your key to unlocking real estate success in California. This is the the Selling Sandoval podcast. I'm Victoria Sandoval, and I'm excited to embark on this journey with you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Selling Sandoval. Our guest is Ali Zane. Thank you for joining us again for uh, session number two regarding credit. Uh, so just a quick introduction. If you didn't listen to the first podcast, interview with him. Um, he is a credit restoration coach. He's licensed uh, LDA in California Superior Court, which he explained in the uh, last episode what that meant. He's helped thousands, well, hundreds, close to thousands of clients uh, repair their credit. And he used to uh, run a mortgage company as well. So he's a wealth of knowledge. Welcome again, um, and thank you for your time. I'm sure everyone's excited to listen to this this, uh, episode because if you listen to our first episode, we already learned about the different mortgage uh, scores. And basically, uh, at this point, you probably have already run your credit score um, and you understand what scores are needed for approval. Um, and again, in this episode, we're going to give you the resources on how to increase your credit score and get those target scores for a mortgage approval. All right. So, um, all right. So if we can rehash the last episode as far as the parameters needed needed to get a uh, home loan, let's let's go ahead and do that now. <laughs> yeah. So in the last episode, we get we got over we went over if somebody has even average or slightly below average credit, their chances of getting approved for a home loan are pretty decent, uh, thanks to the FHA program, which is the first time home buyers program, which requires a score of somewhere from 580 to 600 to get one's foot in the door um, uh, in Mm -hmm. most cases. And the down payment requirement is pretty low for that program too. And the reason why that program exists that it's government backed. So if, somebody defaults on the loan, the government basically will come in and help out the lender. So lenders are not as stingy when it comes to giving out those loans and, you know, um, uh, and have good terms as well, too. And, um, uh, and then we also went over that your the credit scores that we're seeing online are not the scores that lenders look at. Uh, in order to actually look at the real credit scores, you're going to go to a website called MyFICO, or you may have to go to a mortgage broker or lender. Um, they're going to look at the FICO versions of your credit score. And within those, there is a auto loan score, there's a credit card score, there's a mortgage score. So each of these industries, depends on what type of a loan have has, have you applied for, runs a different mm-hmm. version of that score. And um, so, so that's pretty much... It, right. I think as, as to the rehash, um, one thing else that I would uh, like want to want to tell people is the scores that people are seeing online on Credit Karma are not the real scores. So please take them with a grain of salt. They're nowhere even they may not even be close to what a mortgage company would pull. So that's a cautionary, you know, word here. All right. So the best way to get your your mortgage credit score would be to speak to a mortgage broker and have them run your credit. There's there's no there's no other system that they that a <clears throat> a client can use that you know of as of now. My yeah, myfico.com. Uh, myfico.com. You'll get, you'll get will give you different versions of the credit score, but okay, um, they'll give you like seven eight versions of, of your credit score, and one of them is going to be geared towards mortgages, but you're going to end up spending like four, 40 bucks or something to that extent to get the full, you know, uh, uh, layout of the different type of scores there. Okay. So uh, let's talk about the psychology of credit and how this system has traumatized people. Cause you were, you had mentioned earlier pre uh, previously to 
prior to recording, sorry, uh, how you've experienced how buyers have felt really, uh, not buyers in general, but clients have felt really bad about themselves. They feel kind of ashamed or scared to check their credit, right? Yeah, yeah. That's so, unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, keep in mind that, you know, I've gone through a similar process myself of like having to restore my credit and what have you. Um, and I, and this kind of like, you know, my story is that, you know, back in 2010, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, having some family issues. My dad passed away and I kind of like, you know, was in mental breakdown. I ended up losing my home, my cars and all this stuff. And I remember walking mm -hmm. into Verizon, which actually the same phone number that I have till this day back in 2012, I'd say, and like having, you know, there's so much and, you know, I was so timid walking into Verizon. I'm like, I hope I don't get turned down. And it was right. just like, I was just applying for, a, you know, there was just a lot of shame around, yeah. around this, you know, and I realized I'm like, yeah, this is what people go through on a daily basis. And unfortunately, you know, the credit scoring system, you know, in a way, ha you know, it's taken people's dignity away. Absolutely. And people, people are told that, hey, if you have bad credit, you're a bad person. Well, keep in mind that, yes, we have some bad actors that commit fraud, but those are like less than 1% of the population, if that. And these are the guys that steal identities and and so forth and, you know, on purpose like defraud banks. But majority right. of people in this country are just trying to get by, um, you know, and given the fact where wages are for most people, right? Like we're, you know, I think the average American has like less than a week's reserve you know, so it's very possible for mm. anybody of millions and millions of people to fall behind on something. You lose mm. your job, have a debt in the family or a family member gets, you know, gets unhealthy and you have to pay their bills, you know, right. or your kid has to go to college. You know, people have to make these decisions. And, right. you know, we're basically told, you know, in the system that if you have low credit, you are not enough. You're a bad person. There's something wrong with you. And. Mm. You know, many lenders, unlike yourself, just discard these people that, you know, have low credit and because they're like, hey, come back to us when things are better. Right. Uh, and, you know, and, and the problem is that I tell people and there there's kind of like a there there are kind of like two two ends to this. One thing is that, you know, now, thankfully, I have good credit. But now, back in the day when I, you know, before I my credit became you know, before I went through a financially difficult period, I used to have a lot of pride in my credit. Like, hey, my score is 750. This says this about, right? Yeah. Yes. You know? <laughs> I'm the man. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah. It's like, yeah. And I would just look at my credit report and like pat myself on the back. Right. Yeah. And I remember when, uh, uh, so it became a source of validation. And I remember right. when, you know, my credit score tubed, I emotionally, I tubed with it. Mm. And, you know, and then finally, you know, I realized, you know, after walking to that Verizon store, I realized, oh, I get it. Like, this is not, this is not me, right? Like, right. this has nothing got to do with who I am as a human being. So exactly. when my credit got better, it didn't really, like, I didn't, I didn't drive that validation piece from it, right? So I'm like, hey, mm -hmm. my credit's good. It doesn't make, it doesn't make me any better than anybody else. It doesn't make me worse than anybody else either. It just is a reflection that, hey, I'm financially doing okay. It has nothing to do with who I am as a human being, period. End of exactly. Story. Yeah, exactly. Thanks for sharing that story because I feel like I would say 90% of America uh, Americans have experienced that feeling, I myself included, where you just kind of feel like a piece of caca, for lack of a better word, <laughs> if yeah. your credit is not, uh, if it's not perfect. And uh, it's, now let me ask you this, is the credit scoring system, is it rigged against people? Yeah, so here's, here's an interesting thing, right? Um, let me tell you something really bizarre, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's just say it's, if you're making decent income and what have you, you apply for, and this has happened a lot, people have applied for a six seven hundred thousand dollar home right and they've come to me and they said hey we fell behind on a one dollar interest payment and our score went down a hundred points wow what, <laughs> what sense does that make exactly <laughs> so 
the, here's the thing about credit. Credit does not differentiate, the credit scoring system does not differentiate between a $1 mispayment and a $10,000 mispayment or a collection. I it see. does not differentiate between a $10 collection and a $10,000 collection or a million dollar collection. So I understand that if somebody has a serious delinquency in terms of amounts, right? Like it's a large amount that their credit score should be dinged and what mm -hmm. have you, right? But you know, if I make $80,000 a year and I miss a $10 bill, it's not because I didn't have the money to pay. So the credit system assumes automatically that everything on your credit report is due to some financial hardship. Now, mm -hmm. I've gotten into arguments with people at FICO, one of their directors. And I call them out. And I'm like, what? how do you justify digging somebody 100 points over a $1 late payment if that person makes $70,000 a year? Can't your credit scoring system understand that this is an oversight not to dig them? And their right. response was, well, you know, the banks understand this. No, the banks don't understand this. Like the banks actually use this to their advantage. They're like, oh, you have a 640 credit score and you have a $1 mispayment or a $10 collection or a $50 collection. So our guidelines say at this credit score, you get a crappy rate. Mm -hmm. so this is one way, yeah. So this is one way that banks know that you're not a, you're not a risk, but, the, but wink, wink, they'll tell you, oh, we're just looking at the credit score. And guess what? Banks and the FICO scoring system, they have a marriage where banks tell FICO how to score credit reports. They advise them on what the FICO system should spit out. Oh, so, okay. So these scoring models and these credit bureaus do not exist for consumers or people like me and you. They, have, they exist for the big banks so that they could assess risk for people. Interesting. So- so if we're not the ones that are filling the coffers of FICO and these credit bureaus uh, and what have you, then, mm -hmm. you know, they don't, don't really care. Uh, so they will only defer to the bank. So therefore, the banks, you know, on one hand, here's what I tell people. If you have messed up credit in this, com in this country and um, you've defaulted on bills, you know, you could bet your butt that your score is going to be low. But there is no guarantee that even if you've if you're financially able and in good standing with everything, like something like you missing one payment, a small payment could lead to bad credit, you know? So, so this is kind of like one of the major, major issues with credit that it doesn't take into consideration people's income, people's ability to pay uh, and what have you. And all it's looking at is very raw data. And I think it's by design. Interesting. So if someone were to be in that scenario where they did, they did default by a dollar, right? Uh, yeah. Or, you know, I've had situations where I've paid off my credit cards, and then the annual fee kicks in, right? And I don't know, yeah. I think, hey, my credit cards paid for I don't even bother opening those letters, because it's just like a, a statement to show it's a zero balance, right? And then all of a sudden, I'm behind. Thank God, you know, that sometimes the banks will call or the creditors will call um, and say, hey, we haven't received a payment. So you get alerted before. But I mean, I was so close to getting a 30 day late over something so small. So in a situation like that, is it easy to get that removed from your credit or do you, you just got to let let it season mm. for a while? So here's what I was your experience. You. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, we've dealt with this issue a lot and this is what mm -hmm. keeps people from getting approved very often. And, um, the, you know, most of the time I tell people, Hey, make a call to the lender and just see if they'll be willing to remove this as a courtesy, because sometimes they mess up and, uh, they didn't, they don't send a bill out or something to that extent. So if they see some error in their system, they, they'll, they'll more than likely make the, make the adjustment, but 95% okay. of the times they don't, they basically say, the credit bureaus keep us from removing late payments because our agreement with the credit bureau states we need to report mm -hmm. accurate information. So if we right. didn't, didn't receive your payment, we can't lie and say we received your payment. That's the line that they use, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they say that this is against the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Now, in you know, uh, however, what the Fair Credit what's not in the fair what the Fair Credit Reporting Act says if you're going to report something, report something accurately, but it does not keep the lender from removing something. So, for instance, if your lender, it's your choice to report 
the entire account or not report it. But if you're going to report it, it needs to be reported accurately. So Correct. lenders have this, uh, this choice to remove an entire account, but then the credit bureaus don't want them to remove accounts because the credit bureaus are getting paid when accounts are being reported on a monthly basis as such. Mm -hmm. So, you know, generally, like we have to kind of like thread that needle and, you know, really do a lot. You know, we often have to sue lenders based on violations we see on credit reports and so forth, you know, mm -hmm. help people file arbitration cases and whatnot. So unless there is, unless there is their feet, the lender's feet are put to the fire, they're not willing to do much. Um, Interesting. You know, and generally what a lot of people do is the simplest thing a lot of people do is that they put in these simple credit bureau disputes, but the credit bureaus just check with the lender and ask, hey, was I late? Was this person late or not? And they always defer to what the lender says to the credit bureaus, not what the client is saying. But credit bureau disputes are effective if something, you know, let's just say if you had an account that had been closed for five, six years and the lender had no record of you in their system as ever being a client, then if one does a credit bureau dispute, that may end up working. But that's in very, very remote instances. So in a situation where a client has called a bank and the bank refuses and they basically give, basically give them the same spiel where we can't lie and we have to report this, this and that, should they just settle for that answer? Or is it worth it for the client to try to contact you for additional help to see if would you recommend that they take no for an answer or? <laughs> well, first of all, when somebody calls me and says, hey, I want to restore this, the first thing I ask them is, hey, make a quick yes or no phone call to the lender and see what they say. You may get, you may be one of those one or 20 people that may get lucky. And if not, okay. then I'll have a look at it and see what we could do. Generally, okay. there are certain lenders that are very tough to deal with. There are certain lenders that are much easier to deal with as such too. So I always tell the clients that, hey, whatever issue you have, let's call, call us you know, talk to a professional and then let us figure out if we're the right fit for you. And if we're not, we may give you some self-help tips as such, right? Because in certain instances, credit repair is effective depending on who the lender is, what the circumstances, and in other, in other cases, um, you know, it's not as much. Okay. Well, I know you're very, very busy, so I only have a few more questions. Uh, sure. So does credit repair remain bad forever? And what if somebody owes thousands of dollars in debt? Like what are the rights afforded uh, afforded to people by law? Yeah, so thank you for that. That's a great question, you know, and and basically to term it uh, simply is if I fall behind on something uh, or if I have bad credit right now, am I forever doomed? Right. So in the U.S., there's a statute of limitations for seven years for credit reporting. That's what they call the federal statute under the FCRA, which states that if I fall behind on something today, meaning that I stop paying on something totally, that account will stay on my credit report for up to seven years. Uh, if I fall behind on my electricity bill and just stop paying it, same thing. It'll come on my credit report, but it will not exceed seven years. Right. So the seven year period starts from the time the account fell behind. However, I see. Uh, uh, every state has a different statute for uh, statute of limitations for uh, collection activity. So what do I mean by that? Well, that means that let's just say if I fall on fall behind on, say, my car note and my car note gets, you know, my car gets repossessed and I'm on the hook for 10,000 bucks or whatever uh, mm -hmm. after the car is sold. Well, the lender has up to seven years to keep on reporting it on the credit report, but in California, they have up to four years to sue me for that debt as such. Okay. So they could sue me for up to four years and uh, report it for up to seven years. So those are the two most important things that people need to know if they've basically fallen behind on debts and just kind of gone underground and not been able to pay people is that mm. are you past the statute of limitations? Because if you have very large debts, thousands and thousands of dollars, lenders may try to turn around and try to sue. Um, or uh, or if, uh, and also looking at that credit report as to when those debts fall behind, fell behind. So mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't do anything on their credit report, just falls behind on everything today, in seven years time, their credit report would be free and clear of any negative stuff. As long as, you know, they, yes, it is possible that, you know, maybe one in, one in 10 creditors, I would say, I'm taking a guess here, um, uh, that take people to court over a very large thousand dollar, you know, several thousand dollar debts. But for the most part, you know, that's kind of like the rule of thumb that people can kind of like abide by. 
Okay. Well, that's great stuff. Good to know. You learn something every day. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, you are a wealth of knowledge. Uh, we learned so much and I, there's a ton of takeaways. So I took a ton of notes and um, I'm really, really excited to share this with everyone. Thank you for your time once again. And oh, one last question. How can one get a hold of you if they want to hire you for help? Yes. Yeah, so people could go to, to our website, uh, www.imaxcredit.com. You know, uh, uh, our team will be able to get back to them, give them a free consultation and figure out like if credit repair is the right solution for them. And if not, you know, we may, you know, guide them elsewhere or give them some self-help tips uh, and such. Perfect. Great. Thanks so much, Ali. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for listening in. Until next time, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Selling Sandoval podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our podcast and stay tuned for more valuable insights and practical tips. Remember, whether you're a buyer, seller, or an aspiring real estate agent, the Selling Sandoval podcast is your trusted companion in navigating the dynamic California real estate landscape. Until next time, keep dreaming big and making those real estate dreams a reality. This is Victoria Sandoval signing off from the Selling Sandoval podcast, wishing you success and happiness in all of your real estate endeavors.